of the hundreds of researchers that I've interviewed, scientists, you name it, no one has showed a greater overall knowledge and the skill to articulate it in an easily understandable way than Jeffrey M. Smith. His detailed study of GMOs, Monsanto, suppressing science and research is just amazing. Well, here's the exclusive, never before seen and heard interview with Jeffrey M. Smith. My name is Jeffrey Smith, and I'm the executive director and founder of the Institute for Responsible Technology. Our campaign for healthier eating in America is designed to create a tipping point of consumer rejection against genetically modified foods in order to force them out of the market. Genetically modified foods are foods where the gene from one species, say viruses or bacteria, are forced into the DNA of plants such as soy, corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets. Those are the five major GM crops. And the derivatives of those crops, unfortunately, are in the vast majority of processed foods. So when you look and see soy lecithin or soy protein or high fructose corn syrup, even sugar, unless it says cane sugar, will have genetically engineered sugar beet derivatives. The reason why genetically modified foods got on the market in the first place was because an FDA policy claimed that the agency wasn't aware of any information showing that the foods were significantly different. On that basis, they said absolutely no safety testing was necessary if the biotech companies like Monsanto and Dow and DuPont tell us that the foods are safe, then the FDA has no further questions. The concept that the agency was not aware of differences between GM and non-GM foods was pure fiction. Documents made public from a lawsuit seven years after the policy was created prove that the agency was very well aware that there was differences. In fact, the overwhelming consensus among the FDA's own scientists were that genetically modified foods could create allergies, toxins, new diseases, and nutritional problems. They had urged their superiors to require long-term studies. But you see, the first Bush administration had ordered the FDA to promote the biotechnology industry. And so the FDA recruited for a position they created for him, the, they recruited Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney, who later became Monsanto's vice president. While he was in charge, the policy was created that overruled and ignored the science and the scientists. Now, Michael Taylor, who I believe may be responsible for more food-related illnesses and deaths than anyone in human history, for fast-tracking GMOs onto our food supply, he is now the U.S. food safety czar under the Obama administration. While Obama was campaigning in Iowa, where I'm from, he promised us that he would require mandatory labeling of genetically engineered foods. We've been asking for this for years. In fact, nine out of ten Americans want genetically modified foods to be labeled. But because the FDA is ordered to promote the biotechnology industry, they ignore the desire of nine out of ten Americans in order to protect the economic interests of five GMO companies. We had hopes that Obama would fulfill his campaign pledge, but so far, no luck. Instead, Obama has recruited and put into positions of authority, both in the USDA and the FDA, people with very close ties to Monsanto and the biotechnology industry. So he's been a very big disappointment from the side of those of us looking for a reasonable, rational, and safe policy regarding GMOs. In 2009, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine urged all doctors to prescribe non-GMO diets to everyone. They said animal feeding studies have linked GMOs causally with things like reproductive problems, immune system problems, accelerated aging, dysfunctional regulation of insulin and cholesterol, and organ damage and gastrointestinal problems. They asked for doctors around the country to prescribe non-GMO diets and to give out educational materials to help people understand the risks and the alternatives. There are two main reasons why people genetically modify foods. They either drink poison or produce poison. The poison drinkers are called herbicide tolerant. Most popular variety is Roundup Ready. Let me explain. Monsanto scientists found bacteria growing in a chemical waste dump near their factory, surviving in the presence of their herbicide called Roundup. So they had the brilliant idea, let's put it in the food supply. So they took the gene from the bacterium that allowed it to survive applications of Roundup and put it into soybean, corn, cotton, canola, etc. So now you can spray the field with Roundup and it kills all of the other plant biodiversity in the field, but not the Roundup-ready soy and Roundup-ready corn. 
The other variety of genetically modified crops produces a poison. If they take a gene from a soil bacterium that produces a natural insecticide and put it into the DNA of the plant, so every single cell of every single plant in millions of acres has its own little spray bottle that can kill an insect by destroying its digestive system. Because of the herbicide-tolerant crops, particularly the Roundup Ready crops, there's so much more Roundup being used in the United States. We're just drenching our fields with it. In fact, in the, in the first 13 years since GMOs were introduced, it's estimated that 383 million pounds of more of herbicide were sprayed in the United States because of the GMOs. The pesticide-producing crops are called BT for the soil bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis. Now, there is about a 68 million pound decrease of the use of insecticides on these fields over the first 13 years, but the actual amount of insecticide that's produced within every plant, when you add that all up, it's actually more than the insecticide that it displaces. So the overall impact is greater insecticide use as well. What these changes mean is that the plant might produce more allergens, more toxins, more anti-nutrients, more carcinogens, or even less of these. We don't know. It's a genetic roulette. In fact, the process of approval of these GM crops do not evaluate these type of changes. In Monsanto's own studies, which they conveniently left out of their published paper, which we were covered later, they found that in cooked GM soy, there was as much as seven times more of a known allergen called trypsin inhibitor, and about a doubling of an anti-nutrient called soy lectin, which blocks the absorption of certain nutrients. In genetically modified corn, a gene which is normally switched off was switched on to produce an allergen, and other proteins were truncated or changed in shape, which can change a harmless protein into a potentially deadly one. In fact, uh, when they looked at that corn variety, they found 43 different proteins that had significantly changed their levels of expression because of the genetic insertion. So these could be called wreaking havoc with our health or the environment, but no one has evaluated them. One of the most consistent features of the animal feeding studies is immune responses. Immune responses are the body's reaction to something that they can, it considers foreign and may be harmful. By definition, genetically modified crops have something foreign, which may be harmful. Now, the immune system problem has been seen consistently in rats, in mice, in any time they test for GMOs. What we're seeing in the human population since GMOs were introduced is an increase in autoimmune disease, inflammation, and allergies. And these are the kind of things that we would predict if the animal feeding studies were to carry out into human experience. I want to explain two different categories of things that can go wrong. One is for the BT crops. The biotech industry feels confident in putting an insecticide, a toxin called BT, into our corn and cotton plants. And their excuse is that we have a history of safe use using BT in agriculture. It's a soil bacterium. When it's gathered up, the spores and the bacterium, it can be sprayed on plants to kill insects. Then it biodegrades or washes off. But what the biotech engineers do is they take the gene that produces that toxin out of the bacterium and put it into the crop. But the crop produces the bacterium at thousands of times the concentration of the natural spray form. It doesn't wash off. It doesn't biodegrade. In fact, it's designed molecularly to be more toxic than the natural form. It even has properties of a known allergen. The natural form by itself, however, is not that safe. In fact, peer-reviewed published studies show that when the natural BT toxin is fed to mice, it causes tissue damage and an immune response as powerful as if they've been fed cholera toxin. According to peer-reviewed published studies, when BT toxin was sprayed by plane for gypsy moth infestation in the Pacific Northwest, about 500 people complained of allergic or flu-like symptoms. Some had to go to the hospital. Now, thousands of farm workers in India who are picking the cotton engineered to produce that same BT in higher concentrations are complaining of the same allergic and flu-like symptoms, and some have to go to the hospital. When they allow animals to graze on the cotton plants after harvest, thousands of sheep, buffalo, and goats have died. I visited one village where they had allowed their buffalo to graze without harm for years on natural cotton plants after harvest. They allowed 13 buffalo to graze on BT cotton plants for one day, January 3rd, 2008. Within three days, all 13 buffalo were dead. 
They also lost 26 goats and sheep. I asked the villagers, how many of you personally have had itching from working in the BT cotton fields? Most of them raised their hands. In the state of Haryana, India, they feed cottonseed cake to buffalo. Most buffalo actually refuse to eat the cottonseed cake, but those that eat it, most have reproductive problems, including sterility, premature deliveries, abortions, and many of the calves died and adults died. We've also seen about two dozen farmers in the Midwest claim that their cows or pigs became sterile from certain varieties of BT corn. A farmer in Germany says that 12 of his cows died when fed exclusively a variety of BT corn. And in the Philippines, when people were living next to a particular BT corn variety, during the time of pollination, the people in the village experienced skin, respiratory, and intestinal reactions and fever. When the same seeds were planted in four more villages, the same symptoms returned. They also reported deaths among water buffaloes, chickens, and, and horses, and unexplained human deaths. When the Italian government conducted a study and fed Monsanto's BT corn to mice, the mice had massive immune responses. When the Austrian government fed corn that was both BT and Roundup Ready, the animals had less babies and smaller babies. Now these are the problems that may be resulting from the BT toxin itself, or they may be resulting from the massive collateral damage that results from the process of insertion. We don't know because no one is looking. In the case of Roundup Ready soy, we see a lot of serious problems. Soon after the GM soy was introduced to the UK, soy allergy skyrocketed by 50%. We know that there are many reasons why GM soy might be associated with higher levels of allergies. In fact, a skin prick test shows that some people can react to the GM soy, but not to a wild variety of soy. And they also found a new protein that was, had allergenic properties that was in the GM soy, but not the wild variety. When they fed GM soy to mice, there was a reduction in digestive enzymes by as much as 77%. When you impair digestion, it might increase the ability for allergens. This was of grave concern to the FDA scientists who said it would be a serious health hazard to introduce an antibiotic-resistant marker gene. They were concerned that the gene might transfer to pathogenic bacteria and create super diseases. Knowing that soy genes transfer, we know that, that the antibiotic resistant genes might also transfer to create super diseases. When they fed genetically modified soy to female rats before they got pregnant, more than half of their babies died within three weeks. The babies were also much smaller on average and in a subsequent study could not reproduce. When they fed genetically modified soy to male rats, the testicles actually changed from the normal pink to blue. When they fed genetically modified soy to male mice, their testicles also changed and damaged the young sperm cells. And when they looked at the offspring at the embryo stage of parent mice that were fed genetically modified soy, their DNA functioned differently compared to when parent mice ate non-GM soy. When they fed hamsters genetically modified soy for two years over three generations, by the third generation, most of the parent hamsters that were eating genetically modified soy lost the ability to have babies. The GM soy group also developed more slowly and matured sexually more slowly as well. It turns out the Roundup, which is being sprayed on millions of acres, primarily because of the Roundup ready crops, has a tremendous impact on health. Now, it's designed actually to damage the health of plants. That's how, it, it's, that's how it's an herbicide. When you spray a plant with Roundup, what it does is it goes into the plant and accumulates into the, into the parts of the plant that we eat. It also gets pushed out the roots into the soil, where it destroys beneficial microorganisms and enhances the harmful microorganisms, like, like fusarium, which can produce mycotoxins, which themselves can be harmful to humans and mammals. Now, Glyphosate, which is the main ingredient or the active ingredient in Roundup, was actually originally patented as a chelator, meaning that it binds with or kidnaps and holds hostage certain mineral nutrients like copper and zinc and manganese and magnesium and iron. And so when you spray the glyphosate on the crop, it bounds up the nutrients in the soil, making them less available for the plant. So that's another way that it helps create, it helps kill plants.